I think I just learned through all of this that we can't let anyone or anything define us. We have to learn to define ourselves. And I think that we have to find ways for our mental health and for our peace of mind to find joy. And so we can live in a state of peace and contentment and happiness. Welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Thursday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and I don't know about you, but for the last two days, I have been holding my breath. Hopefully, by the time this episode airs, the results of the election here in the United States will hopefully we'll know the results. I don't know. This has been such a stressful and anxiety producing time and trying to figure out my own mental health and boundaries and honoring those while also staying informed and aware has been very stressful. And I have a feeling it's been very stressful for you too. So the timing of today's new episode could not be more perfect. It's a total, total breath of fresh air on the podcast today. I am joined by Dana Max Pomerantz, and she's the founder and creator behind Instagram's global platform, the Be Happy Project. And the Be Happy Project is a beautiful, positive platform that inspires inner happiness, self-love, and personal growth. What I love so much about this episode and Dana Max's story is that She really would have never started the Be Happy Project if she didn't hit her rock bottom and really have an opportunity to rediscover herself and her joy. And I know I say this all the time on the podcast, but those roadblocks, those moments in our lives that test us, those walls that we hit when those doors don't open, it's always for a reason. And we learn something about ourselves and who we are and what we're capable of and what we're made of, but also we find ourselves on the right path. I really believe in those moments. And so in this week's episode, Dana Max and I chat about the inspiration behind the Be Happy Project, the key to finding inner happiness and really doing the self-work to get to the self-like. We talk about how really through healing and resilience, we can begin to define ourselves, our self-worth, and begin to live life on our own terms. Plus, Dana Max shares with us the power of a plan B and dreaming another dream and really why you should go for it. I love this part of the episode, how to become comfortable sharing your truth and your story and really why it's so important to honor your boundaries. I'm so excited to share today's new episode with Dana Max, and I cannot wait to hear what you think. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. Don't forget, if you're on Spotify listening right now, hit follow. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, hit subscribe. And while you're there, leave us a five-star rating and review. Ratings and reviews help the podcast get seen by new people and spread our mission as far and wide as possible, but also tells people what Seek the Joy podcast is all about. When you leave that review, take a screenshot, send it to me, sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com, and I'll send you a little something something to say thank you. Defining yourself and your worth and your joy and really living life on your own terms is such a beautiful theme in today's episode and it honestly couldn't be more timely I think in a in a time and in a year when so many of us are facing uncertainty and discomfort and shifts and change in a way that maybe we've never experienced before and I know that Dana Max's words and wisdom and perspective will totally inspire you and so I, I can't wait for you guys to listen to this one so Without further ado, here is my conversation with Dana Max of the Be Happy Project. I think I would love to start off by talking 
about your journey and your journey with the Be Happy Project. Where did the inspiration come? How did you start it? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I started the Be Happy Project in 20, I think it was 2013. Um, I was in fashion most of my life. I had a dream since I was about seven of being a fashion designer. So I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology for design. Um, after school, college, I worked in design for Betsy Johnson and Mark Jacobs. And I saved up all my money working for those two companies, moved back home with my parents, like the totally uncool thing to do. Um, <laughs> and I started my business in 2007 in New York City. Um, and we did very well. We were uh, selling to stores across the U.S., internationally. We were on every celebrity, every publication, um, really it splashed across everything. But behind the scenes, I was struggling financially. Um, I was investing in my company and so were my parents. I did not have outside investors. Mm -hmm. And so around 2013, um, I started the process of making the decision that I knew I would have to close my business at some point. Um, it was a two year closing, so to speak. So in 2015, I finally closed it. But um, I started the Be Happy Project in 2013 because I was realizing that my happiness was always tied to my success, my, um, you know, if I was doing well, I was like beaming and I was so excited and I felt it so hard. And if, yeah. you know, if somebody rejected me or I missed an opportunity or the, just the, the business closing itself, I was so suffering inside. And so I, I started to be happy about it to try and teach myself, you have to learn how to be happy in the moment. It can't be tied to anyone or anything. Um, and the closing of my business, just so everyone knows, was um, really, I felt like I lost the mm -hmm. love of my life. I, I thought it was a death. Um, I, that was the way I grieved it. And so I was in years of therapy. I lost myself in the process. I suddenly, when I officially closed it, had no idea who I was. Um, and so it taught me a lot. And through the Be Happy Project, I have um, been able to learn and really practice inner happiness and, and find it and not just tie it to anything. And for the last, I would say five, six years, I've been living in a constant state of honestly, like peace and contentment mm -hmm. and happiness. I love what you just shared about your journey and how your happiness was tied to success. And I've talked about this before mm -hmm. on the podcast too, about how often we tie our happiness or our joy or even our self-worth to yep. external things, to success, to how, you know, how I perform at school or the job I get mm -hmm. or whether or not I get this promotion. And I'm curious how you began to shift this perception of success for you. Yeah, that's another great question. So, um, with the help of my therapist, who was fantastic, um, I practiced, um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated mm -hmm. with closing my business and losing my dream and losing myself in the process. So I had to first figure out how to release the shame. Um, so I, with the help of my therapist and with a lot of Brene Brown books, mm -hmm. I um, She's really the best. learned- she is amazing mm -hmm. and she that's what she does. She's an expert on shame. And so I would highly recommend her books. And so um, I just kind of dived into therapy and her books and just learned how to release the shame. I cared, I realized I cared so much about what everybody thought of me during my time, you know, becoming successful. And when I hit rock bottom, I cared so much still what everyone thought of me. They would think I'm a failure. They would think I'm a disgrace. I, how, how could she fail? We thought she was doing so well. And so um, there was so much emotional identity tied to hitting rock bottom. So that was the first step, um, learning how to release my shame and my guilt. And following that was reclaiming my life and refinding mm -hmm. myself and learning that you know what? I can dream another dream. I can um, surround myself with good, happy people. I can start collecting moments of joy, which in the long term create lifelong happiness. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was living in such a chaotic, uh, I hate to say this, but superficial world. And the fashion industry does tend to be very superficial. And so I suddenly wanted a lot more meaningful purpose in my life. And okay, how do I how do I get to that place? And I still had no idea what I was doing or who I was, but 
through the Be Happy Project, and it's it's since grown, I think we're at like almost half a million followers now. I mean, through that project, I just learned how to reclaim my life. And all of a sudden I was like, you know what, maybe this is part of my journey. And I never would have done this if it weren't for my failure and mm-hmm. my former self. Um, and I've also had to rephrase failure because I think failure, um, just the word itself is just so heavy and dark. Yeah. So yeah. I, re- yeah, so I've rephrased it to, um, it's an opportunity for growth. So now anytime, you know, if I hit a bump in the road or someone rejects me or an opportunity doesn't work out, I'm like, that's okay. It's, it's just an opportunity for growth. They may not be right for me. I may not be right for them right now, but it could be right next month. It mm-hmm. could be right next year. And if not, I'm still worthy. I still have value and someone else is going to see that. So, um, you know, once you get past the the releasing of the shame and the guilt and you start focusing on gratitude and, um, surrounding yourself in joy, you then also start shifting into this frame of mind of practicing. I call it like the practicing the pause, meaning, Mm -hmm. um, before emotionally reacting to some, someone or something that is throwing negativity your way or rejecting your, whatever it is, just breathe. Mm -hmm. Just, I do a lot of breath work, just breathing through it. I step away. So that way I'm not, I'm teaching myself how to not be emotionally tied. And with that also comes the art of non-attachment. So the art of non-attachment is practicing. It's sort of detachment is is a basic Mm -hmm. way of saying it. So you're not, you're teaching yourself through the pause and the non-attachment, how to not tie yourself emotionally. So when there are bumps in the road, when someone is not nice to you, when you're, you're rejected, when you're not doing as well as you had hoped, you just are able to step away and not, um, you don't allow that shame, that guilt, that anger, uh, that sadness to live in you. Yeah. So that it's, it's a complicated process, but it, it takes work and effort, but you can get to peace and contentment and just a beautiful life. Yeah. I, I, I love what you just shared. And I want to go back to something that you said about failure being an opportunity for growth and how mm-hmm. I think it, you said that you had to really rephrase or change the way you looked at failure. And that's been key for me in my life too, of the minute I changed my definition of success, I then changed my definition of failure. So for me, it wasn't so much about, you know, and I think this is a lot of what you were saying too, of not tying it to the external. And for me, if I showed up and I applied for that job, that's a win. If I showed up and I pushed myself, you know, in a new way outside of my comfort zone, that was a win. That was success. And so I love what you said about really not only failure as an opportunity for growth, but within that growth is changing how you look at yourself, how you identify, you know, who you are in your in the world. This sense of self worth is tied to that inner peace and that inner happiness, which I think comes from hitting, you know, like like landing on your butt, trying something new, and yeah. it doesn't go the way that you planned. And and knowing for yourself, you said this too, that it's about knowing that you have a plan B, that you can mm-hmm. do something else, that there's more out there for you. I'm curious how you really arrived at understanding or knowing that for yourself, because I think sometimes we feel like, oh, we have this one dream. That's it. You know, one and done. We limit ourselves. We don't think that there's so much more that we can do or that we should do. And when we get those curveballs that come our way, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult or challenging to pivot or it doesn't feel natural. So I'm curious about what that was like for you. Yeah. So, and you're asking very good questions, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I appreciate these questions. So, um, you know, so the dream that I had, I've had that dream to be a fashion designer. I had that dream since I was seven years old. Mm-hmm. And so that was all I knew. And like you said, I was under the impression if you work hard and you have tenacity and you have talent, you're going to succeed. You're never going to fail. And I had this one dream and that was it. And it turns yeah. out life had a different plan for me. And so I think a lot of the the shifting your perspective and your mindset on what failure is, is number Number one, understanding that success is subjective. And I've even learned this through the Be Happy Project. Um, you know, if I, I work with various brands and companies and people and success to one person could be like, I just want like 
five new followers, you know, mm -hmm. and success to another company, you know, they want like a million new downloads. So it's, it varies and it really, yeah. um, and I think when you're in the arts, especially acting, singing, um, fashion, what, anything creative, you know, people's perspective of you is also subjective and what they think of you in terms of your, um, value in that industry is also subjective. So you have to just understand it really has nothing to do with you. And it has mm -hmm. to do people's mm -hmm. opinions and thoughts of you has to do with their own personal experiences. And so, and their likes and dislikes. So, and everyone has different experiences and different mm -hmm. likes and dislikes. So that's the first thing. And I think the second thing to shift your mindset on failure is letting go of expectations. And I think expectations are what kills us inside. And so I always had this expectation that I would be the next Diane von Furstenberg. That was my goal. That was my dream. And I worked hard to try and achieve that. And I just realized life has other plans. And so you have to be open to life. You can't catastrophize things. Um, you know, they always say hope for the best, plan for the worst. And mm -hmm. so just don't expect, like you can enjoy something. You can, like you said, find moments of joy. Like if you're about to take an exam, yes, be prepared, work hard for that, that a, that, that grade that you want. And if you get a B or a C, okay, take that as a lesson. Like, what can I learn and do differently next time taking an exam? How can I prepare a little differently? And don't be hard on yourself. I think in those times, especially you have to be compassionate to yourself. Um, and don't be like, Oh, what, what I do wrong. It's not what you did wrong. It's just, okay, what can I do differently? And that's the only way you're going to learn because life throws us the same lesson over and over and over again in different shapes and forms until we learn our lesson. And so totally. let's, let's get these lessons out of the way early on, right? And then we can live this, this amazing life. Yeah, I found that the same lesson will show up and it'll show up in a bigger way in an, mm -hmm. like, a, like a way that it's really going to capture your attention until you actually recognize like A, mm -hmm. what you're supposed to learn, B, maybe how you're supposed to pivot and then C, what you're yep. supposed to take from that moment. What you just said really reminds me about it not being about the outcome, but having it be more about the journey and the experience and the lessons yep. you learn along the way. And, and that reminds me too of what you shared earlier about non-attachment and how you've been practicing that, you know, throughout your life. I'm curious mm -hmm. this year in 2020, especially how have you been practicing non-attachment? What role maybe has mindfulness or self-awareness played for you, um, in, you know, not only being able to pivot, but I, I'm, I'm assuming maybe this year you have had to pivot as well. Um, cause I know so many of us have in, in the crazy yeah. time that we're living in. Yeah. So I would say, you know, the things I think that are overwhelming for people, most people in 2020, um, are, you know, because of the pandemic feeling isolated and alone from others. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a mom, so I've had to juggle work and being a wife and being a friend and uh, along with watching my toddler daughter more hours out of the day than I had planned. Um, and yeah. you know, the pandemic was unexpected life threw us a curveball, and we all had to adjust. Um, and then I think that in conjunction with, um, you know, the election and the weather change and anything else that could possibly happen, mm -hmm. you know, in 2020 is all kind of coming together in this perfect storm. So, um, you know, I think for me, what has helped is, Definitely breath work. Definitely. Um, you know, I, I listen to a lot of music on Spotify to help me calm down at night. Um, I turn to my, my core inner circle for support, um, whether that's my husband or my family or my closest friends. Um, I use better help for my talk therapy. So I speak to a therapist once a week. Um, and when I'm feeling stressed about things, I do things like if it's the election, I don't watch the news. Um, I don't five muted like a million accounts on my personal account who bring up anything related to the election. You know, what, no matter what side you're on, I just I find it to be pretty toxic overall. Um, and it makes me feel very um, like, I don't know, antsy, I guess. And so totally. Yeah. I, you, social media is a big one. I've, you know, you can mute people. They don't have to know about it. Um, so that's something that's helped me. I don't watch the news. Um, I only follow accounts that uplift me and are nonpartisan in terms of the election. Um, and then I think in terms of 
feeling isolated from others, I've tried to just remind myself that we're all in this together and this, this too shall pass. And, um, you know, if I'm feeling stressed, I try to do things to take my mind off it. I, I, you know, do like a zoom with a friend or I call my family or, um, I take, I go outside and take a walk in a safe Mm -hmm. way. So Mm -hmm. whatever it is, just know that this is temporary and feelings are, they're, they're temporary too. They come and go, they're like guests. So you can hang out with them, whether it's anger, sadness, happiness, it doesn't matter. Hang out with it, you know, feel that feeling, but then you got to release it and let it go. It can't live in your home, which is your your self. And I think a lot of people get so stuck in a feeling that they're feeling. There's nothing to be scared of. Mm -hmm. Just hang out with it and let it go. By the time this episode comes out, we'll be probably a couple of days out of the election. And so you've mentioned this a little bit, but what you just shared really reminds me of a process and a practice in, you know, honoring your boundaries and knowing Mm -hmm. what you're comfortable with and what you're not. And also I think part of boundaries, I think when we set good boundaries for ourselves, we feel better or more comfortable or confident in sharing our truth and sharing, you know, what is true for us, what we're, what we're passionate about, what brings us joy, but also maybe the things we're worried about. And so I'm curious, you know, through the Be Happy Project, you really are sharing your truth. You share, you know, motivational quotes and words of wisdom. You have these great lives that you do and then that you share on your feed. And so I'm curious, were you always comfortable in sharing your truth in that way? Um, Or was it something that you had to sort of push yourself? And yeah, what was that process like? Because it's not, it doesn't come naturally, you know, for everybody. Yeah, I have to tell you, your questions are so good. (laughs) And (laughs) I've been doing a lot of podcasts. Yeah, they're really good. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I know, I love your questions. So no, I was not always comfortable um, speaking my truth. I, I was comfortable in the sense of, I understood our community. And so I only shared things that I knew would resonate with them. And Mm -hmm. I only also always have shared things that I practice myself. So that was always my truth. But what wasn't was because I was um, really struggling with the shame of, um, you know, letting go of my dream and my, my fashion business for so long. It wasn't until this past April where I was like, I really need to start putting out my story and getting it out there because people are asking, who's this person behind this account? What's motivated you to create it? And so I was like, I'm doing other people a disservice by not sharing my journey because I know there are other people out there who have experienced pain and grief and the loss of a dream, you know, in a, in a similar way or fashion. And so, um, yeah, it wasn't until April I started putting my face on my giveaways or on the lives. And once I kind of got past that, like, fear factor of doing yeah. it, and I quickly said to myself, Dana Max, you've worked so hard. You can't care what people think. Just put yourself out there. And I did. And slowly I just started feeling more comfortable. And people were, like, even more connected to the mm. platform because – I don't push myself out there, but I think it's important to, um, show, you know, show myself a little bit and my, and share my journey with others. And so it's actually worked, I think for the better. And yeah. people, I feel so much less isolated during the pandemic because now people message me and they're like, Dana Max, hi, you know, as if we're like friends. Yeah. I and love so that. I love cool. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. So I would tell anyone, um, just take that. That first step is always the hardest and trust your instincts. It wasn't until April. And again, I've had this account since 2013. It wasn't until April of 2020 where I felt safe enough within myself. And I've gotten past that shame and that guilt where I could share my journey with others. Yeah. It had to start, it sounds like with an acceptance of your journey and acceptance of where you are now, which to get to that space of acceptance, I've found you often get there by doing life on your own terms, which means defining who you are against your own standard, against your own values, um, defining your worth that way too. Because like we talked about, I think at the very beginning of our conversation, you know, oftentimes we define or we attach our self-worth to external things or external people Mm -hmm. or a result of some sort. And tying into that is this journey of self-love. And so I would love to know if you're willing to share a little bit about your journey or path to self-love, because 
it's not easy. I still, at times, I'm constantly redefining what my self-love is um, and how I look at it and, and how I embrace it. And so I'm curious what your journey has been like getting to this space of, of self-love for yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I think I've always in a way struggled with self-love um, because I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was about seven years old, around the same time that I developed my passion and purpose in life. And so mm -hmm. um, I felt really different. I felt like an outsider. I felt like no one understood why I felt different because it was an invisible disease to most people. Um, but it was, right. it, it, it's a disease where you are managing it 24 seven and it feels like a job unto itself. And so, um, I have struggled with that for probably over 20 years until I got to a place where I started feeling comfortable in my own skin with the disease. Um, so that definitely for me, it impaired my ability to love myself and like myself for who I was. And then once I got through the, the nastiness of, you know, losing my dream and myself, um, I found, wait a second, like I actually like myself, even if mm -hmm. I don't have this dream anymore, even if I don't have my business anymore and I've lost some quote unquote friends from it. Like it, it, who cares? Like I'm still a kind person. I'm funny. Um, I have good people in my life. There's so much more I can offer this world. And so I started to practice daily self love. What I, what I like to call, cause I think self love is a heavy term and I think it's unreachable for a lot of people. I think you mm -hmm. got to do the self work to get to the self like, Ooh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. So I got to the self like, and I have days where I have self love love for sure. And there are days where I'm just like, you know, my, like we, we talked about earlier, my hair is a mess today. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I don't love my hair today. I don't really like it, but I got hair. You know what I mean? So it's like, right. I'm black, but I even have hair. So I try and put a, put a different perspective on things. And I try to focus on self like every day. I listen to music that empowers me. Um, I sometimes put post-its around my house and my drawers. When I open a drawer, I forget, I put it there and it says like, I like myself today, or, you know, I'm smart, I'm kind, whatever it is. And I also work on self like with my two-year-old daughter. So, um, I'm trying to implement in any way I can. And through the be happy project, I do it as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's constant reminders. I love this concept of self-like and you have to do the self-work to get to the self-like. I love mm -hmm. that because that's true. It really is a process of doing, an, doing the inner work and the inner work is actually going to look so different for everyone because we all have different struggles or barriers or life experiences in general that really shape the way that we look at ourselves and shape the way that we look our, at ourselves in the world too. And I'm, I love that you shared that you're also practicing this with your two-year-old daughter. I've reflected so many times on like, I don't know if self-love was something I was taught mm -hmm. when I was really young. And I love that this is something that you're starting to share with her so early on. Are there things that you do with her to help you know, like practice that self, like, are there things that you guys do together? Yeah, we, um, we definitely read books on just feeling good about herself. And, mm -hmm. um, every day I try and, you know, if she's, you know, she's two, so sometimes she has like a mental breakdown out of nowhere. And so I'm trying to get her <laughs> to, um, recognize her feelings. Like, you know, feeling mm -hmm. sad is different than feeling nervous. And, you know, if she's having like a mental breakdown, I just say to her, what are you feeling right now? Can you share with me? And I get down to her level. So I try and create like a safe space for her to share those feelings. And she's learned now, like today she said, I, I didn't feel comfortable. I felt nervous. Instead mm -hmm. of usually she used to say, I'm sad, I'm frustrated. And now she's learning to really hone in on that feeling. And so getting in touch with herself more is important. And also every day we try and work on, um, you know, I'll say to her, like, you know, she'll come down in like a princess dress and I say, you look beautiful. And then she goes, I'm beautiful. And I said, and you say, I'm smart. And so we start on this like self mm -hmm. self love affirmation path. Um, and so she, she says out loud, I am smart. I am kind, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> I love that because you know, even as adults, we struggle with recognizing what our feelings are. Like, what is this that I'm experiencing in this moment? Like, is it fear? Mm -hmm. Is it anxiety? Is it panic? Sometimes it's just exhaustion that, you know, masks yeah. the self as everything else. So I think that's such a good, I love that you shared that about your daughter, because we can apply this, I think at any age, the power of recognizing your feelings, identifying it, naming it, and then being able to either work through it, or like you shared earlier, 
emotions are like guests. You can spend as much time with them as you want. I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I just think just teaching yourself or teaching your child to not be afraid of your feelings is such a huge thing. Um, and you know, honestly, I grew up in a house that wasn't super feeling oriented. I was kind of like the black sheep (laughs) in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I was very emotional my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've had to learn how to express my emotions, how to be around people who maybe aren't as in touch with their feelings as I am and allow them to feel safe to express their feelings too, because a lot of people don't know how to. And, um, and like you said, a lot of people don't even know what they're feeling. And so, yeah, I think it takes work. It really, really does. All of this stuff we're talking about, it takes consistent effort. And I think uh, another piece of it is that, um, you know, we all have this negative voice in our head that likes Mm -hmm. to bring us down and keep us down. And, you know, this really goes to identity, self-love, plan B, everything. And I think a huge part of the self-work is getting that voice to quiet down so it's not so mentally overpowering and um, we take our power back. And so, you know, I've learned anytime I hear that voice come in, I just, I tell it to stop. I literally Mm -hmm. walk away. I do not give it the space, the time, the platform, anything. Um, because whether it's our negative inner critic or, you know, critics in our lives, it could be family members, it could be friends, it could be a boss, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. there's always going to be a voice that tells you or tries to tell you that you're not good enough. And so we have to learn how to shut out the noise and know that we are worthy and good enough, no matter what anybody says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought up the inner critic because yeah, that voice will stop you from chasing after your dreams, from believing you have a plan B, that you have another dream that you can go after, that you're worthy of it. And so getting it to quiet down, I mean, at least at the beginning for me, I remember it was like a full-time job because it just sneaks in, you know, it sneaks in when you least expect it. You could be, you know, taking a walk or working on something that you've done a million times and that voice creeps in and you start to doubt yourself. And, um, I love that you said you really have to take your power back because that voice can start to define you or you can allow it to define you. Mm -hmm. And I I love just what you said about taking your power back. And it sounds like you had to do that at different, you know, points in your life too. And, and really decide for yourself, like, no, this is who I am. Not what that voice says, not with, you know, not having that business anymore would say to somebody else, like, I actually know who I am. And I think that's really powerful too. I Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I think it takes, you know, sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom to learn who you are and reclaim yourself and your mm-hmm. life. And that's okay too. And I think, you know, your dream, it could be a piece of you, a part of you, but it doesn't have to be all of you. And I learned that as well. Um, and the negative voice. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it used to pop in my head all the time unexpectedly. It was just constant noise in my head telling me I wasn't good enough or why didn't I do this better or whatever it is. And so I'm now in a place just because of all the work that I've done, I don't even have a negative voice. I really Mm -hmm. don't. Um, Mm -hmm. because the second in my, like it, it will be once in a blue moon, I'll have my negative voice pop up. I do not let it hang out with me. Like that mm-hmm. is a toxic person. Nobody uh-uh. has time for that. Absolutely not. No, exactly. <laughs> and it goes back to what you said, creating healthy boundaries with yourself. Mm-hmm. And so um, the more you can let go and not listen and not give your negative voice like any sort of platform, the more peaceful and content of a life you'll have. And you'll be able to like, you know, if somebody rejects you or um, you don't do as well on a test or you miss an opportunity or your kid is having a mental breakdown, you're not going to take any of those things as personally and you're not going to let it stress you out as much because Mm -hmm. you can just take a deep breath and come back to it. You can figure it out. Um, You just, your whole perspective on these negative situations just changes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're spot on with that. And I think it's about not giving it the time of day, just, just Mm -hmm. not giving it the time of day, not entertaining it. And I, I've had to do that too. You just say, nope, not now. Nope, not now. And it's a constant like mental exercise. I know that so much of your work is centered around really finding inner happiness and inner peace and, and this sense of self-worth. And I'm curious today, how do you define happiness? So uh, to me, happiness is living in the present moment and collecting moments of joy that Mm -hmm. creates 
lifelong, long-term happiness. And um, I don't believe in chasing happiness. I don't believe in chasing people or opportunities for that matter. I think um, you can try and be tenacious about it, but I think chasing kind of says that there's an imbalance going on. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just have to stay balanced. You have to learn how to ride the waves of life. That's a big one. And I think happiness comes with all of that, with peace, with contentment, um, comes happiness. Mm. I love this. It's about collecting moments of joy. And those moments of joy are going to look different for everyone, which is why I think your definition is so beautiful because it's so open-ended. I think sometimes we, I don't know about you, but sometimes we look for others to define our emotions or define our experiences. And this is Mm -hmm. feeling like such a beautiful theme of our conversation of you're defining that and you're defining your joy and defining your happiness. And so I'm curious, what what is bringing you joy right now? Um, You know, both through your work with the Be Happy Project, but, you know, in life in general. So in this moment, what is bringing me joy is spending time with you and connecting with you. And that's how I look at it. I mean, you know, that's part of happiness. That's, that's the point of happiness. It goes back to what I had originally said, which is being present in the moment. And so if you can find joy in the little moments in life, you're going to suddenly all these little moments add up and you're going to be like, wow, I felt really happy today. I felt Mm -hmm. really good. I felt content, you know, whatever it is. And so, yeah, that's, that's, what's bringing me happiness right now. And in terms of, um, the be happy project, you know, we have such a beautiful, wonderful, loyal community and people that are just so introspective, want to do better, want to be better. I mean, it's, it's just incredible just seeing the support that people are able to give and have for one another. And so it brings me joy to see what, a a simple platform. I started it and maybe it got like 10 likes. It had like one follower to start (laughs) what it's grown into. And it's, there's magic in it, you know, Mm -hmm. and I always believe the more I can continue to work on myself and spread good. And and the more that other people are on board with it, the the world would be a better place. And so infusing the world with more, um, joy and connectivity, um, and peace is, is really important to me. And what's so beautiful too, about what you just said is that when you create something out of inspiration or out of joy, it, it speaks for itself. It's, there's like an energy that's kind of attached to it that I think other people can see and they can feel and that they're drawn to. Um, and so I think it's a testament, you know, anyone listening, I think if there's something you want to do and it, it's exciting and it brings you joy and it's going to be inspirational to you and maybe to someone else, I say, do it because you never know, like, just like you shared how it'll grow, who will resonate with it, how it will connect. Um, I think now more than ever, we are searching for that sense of community And often we have to define for ourselves first, you know, what does that community, what does that connection mean to me? And then from there, you can sort of either build it or seek it out or do both. Um, And amazing that you've been doing this for for seven years. (laughs) I think that's awesome. It takes time. People don't realize that. It really totally. It really takes time. And, um, you know, I always say it's like driving like a stick shift. You're sometimes you have to pull back a little, sometimes you have to go faster. You have to read your audience, hear your audience, but stay true to yourself. Um, everything I do on that platform is truthful and, um, with the community in mind. And so the other part of it is if you're going to start something, don't let ego lead you. It has Mm -hmm. to be because you want to be of service to others. And so when you're of service to others, but you're living in your truth, people are going to pick up on that. It's going to be authentic to people. People are really going to resonate with it, with whatever it is that you're sharing. And so ego is, is also something that is very toxic to us as humans. And so, um, you can't, you can't be driven by ego. That's such a good point too. And I think it really is about coming from that space of service. And oftentimes it's that space of service, you come to it through your own experiences and what it is that you need. And then you see how Mm -hmm. you can help serve and seek that out and share that with others too. I mean, when I started the podcast, I really needed connection. I really wanted to talk with other people who had similar stories or experiences or were really willing just to be vulnerable because it was something that I really needed. Um, yeah. And at the time I didn't totally know, get that, but about six months in it clicked and I was like, oh, I was, I was searching for <laughs> an opportunity for vulnerability and connection yeah. and community. And so it's amazing, you know, you seek out what it is that you, you need and then you can serve yeah. from that space too. 
I love how you just said that. That is absolutely on point. And yes, and, and when you need something that's different though than ego, you know what I mean? I just want to make sure people totally, understand that. Totally. Um, ego is more of, um, I want to be famous. I want to make a lot of money. Um, I'm only posting quotes that, you know, I like, you know, it's a very me, me, me focus. Um, but yes, I, like I started my platform, the Be Happy Project, because I needed something. I needed to feel mm -hmm. like, people's word meant something because I was coming from an industry where people's word meant nothing. Mm -hmm. And so that was the basis of it. And I wanted to be able to hold myself accountable and, you know, maybe inspire one or two people. I didn't even think anything about growing the platform, <laughs> honestly, it had nothing to do with like, I want this big platform. I want it mm -hmm. to be this, that. And so, you know, it's cool what happened to the Be Happy Project and how much it's grown. But again, what you said, it comes from need and it comes from, you know, trying to be of service to others, not ego. Totally. Totally. Because I was going to ask you, you know, did you ever anticipate that it would grow to the size that it's grown or if it would have, you know, the impact that it's had? And it sounds like absolutely not. And I love that because yeah. you really can yeah. never yeah. anticipate, you know, what's going to happen and what's what's going to come from you just putting something out there. It's so true. And, you know, what makes me feel a little bit more at peace now about my past is that I never would have started the Be Happy Project if I didn't go through the quote unquote failure of my dream, which is, as you know, I call it mm -hmm. my growth, my opportunity for growth. But in, in other ways, it was a failure. And so I never would have started it. And to know that like life has a way of, of working out and leading us in the direction, maybe not that we thought we would go in, but the direction that is good for us. Mm -hmm. And I never, ever would have predicted that the platform would have grown into this. I mean, I literally started and I was like, okay, cool. 10 likes, you know, I got a follower. <laughs> awesome. And that was, that was honest. That was it. And so, um, you know, I was just, and now I'm like, I'm doing things that I, I only would have honestly like dreamed of, but I went from, you know, my dream being all of me and me thinking so far out with fashion and, and my success that when I started this, I just, I had no ego. I literally was just like, I'm doing it just to do it. And even now I'm like, you know what, if this doesn't work out, I, I can go back to the Be Happy Project the way it was seven years ago, like maybe one follower, you know, who cares? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't, I, it doesn't define me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you can start something, but don't let it be all of you take it day by day. And just know if something doesn't work out, you'll mm -hmm. still be okay. You'll still be okay. And you can have a plan C or a plan D yeah. or a plan <laughs> Z. I mean, the opportunity, you know, to reinvent yourself and chase after what's exciting and inspiring and your passions, you know, they shift and change too along the way. And speaking of dreams, I'm curious, you know, what is your biggest dream now? So, you know, to be totally transparent with you, I don't, I like to daydream. I think it's a very freeing um, thing, but I don't like to dream dream because mm -hmm. I had a dream and it didn't work out. And in some ways I'm still healing from that wound, even though it's so many years later, you, you never get past the, the loss of someone or something that was mm -hmm. so um, meaningful and dear to you. And so I've learned from that experience. And I really just, I, I, instead of kind of labeling something, a dream or a passion or a purpose, I don't like those labels. I just look at it as like an opportunity for growth. Like this will lead me into the next direction. This is bringing out so many more good things to my personality and who I want to be. And so, um, I just don't let it define me in that way. Hmm. I think that's an important message too, because yeah. I mean, often we don't, I feel this way too. Sometimes I don't want to tie, you know, put too many eggs in one basket, you know, and get mm -hmm. attached to another outcome, which may not go the way I anticipate or the way I plan, but allowing yourself, I think, to think about the different possibilities and what you could do next and how your passion can grow and evolve. I think, I think those are dreams that we often don't talk about or even think about. So I, I love what you, what you just shared, because I think, I think that's an interesting perspective that I don't know if anyone's even shared that, you know, when I've asked that question before. So I think that's great. I think that's an important reminder for sure. Yeah. And you can, you know, I think there's a beautiful aspect to, um, to daydreaming and things like that, or having a dream. You know, I even have, um, I still keep a notebook on the side of my bed and whenever I have an mm -hmm. idea, I'm an idea person, I write it down. And the more you can, to me, that's dreaming a little bit, but it's not creating one solid dream. Like this is what I want to do, you know, next with the be happy project. This is where I want to take it. Right. I just, I don't live in that anymore. 
Mm-hmm. I never have in the last six years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an important reminder and, and good for your mental health, right? And your well being and yes. your sanity. <laughs> Definitely Absolutely. your sanity. Dana Max, I, I have loved this conversation with you. And I think the last thing I want to ask you, you know, before we go is obviously you've gained so much wisdom from your journey, both with your business and being a fashion designer and then everything kind of going kaput and you arriving at your plan B, which maybe was your plan A to begin with. Who knows? You've gained so much, I think, really solid, beautiful wisdom from your experiences. So I'm curious, what do you think maybe you've learned the most about yourself or about this life um, through through this journey that you've been on? God, another really good question. <laughs> um <laughs> What have I learned? You know, that life is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes it happens in a way that we didn't expect it to happen. And, you know, if I told my younger self, like when I was seven, that, you know, I know you want to be a big time fashion designer, you'll get to it for a little bit, but it's not going to maybe happen for you long term. I, I think I would have been devastated, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. you know, it just, I think I just learned through all of this that um, we can't let anyone or anything define us. We have to learn to define ourselves. And I think that we have to find ways for our mental health and for our peace of mind to find joy. And so we can live in a state of peace and contentment and happiness. And, um, you know, look at everything as an adventure, something new, something exciting, something that will help us grow and, um, Mm -hmm. try not to label everything. Mm -hmm. I think this is a huge theme for the whole conversation is not to define yourself and not to define yourself by someone else's measure. And I, I just love I love the direction this conversation went. I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast and sharing so much of your experiences and your wisdom and the Be Happy Project. So thank you, first of all, for coming oh, on the podcast. And where where can everybody find you, uh, connect and and learn more? Yeah, so um, we're on Instagram and Facebook, but Instagram it's, is the big one. It's at the Be Happy Project. And um, you can always direct message me. I answer all my messages, every single one. So always happy to connect with people. Perfect. Everything's going to go in the show notes. It'll be so easy to connect with you and start following along if everyone isn't already. And again, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm excited well, to share this too. one. And I think it's going to be thank- so refreshing, I think, to share this episode after the election and everything else that's going on. So thank you so much. (laughs) Oh my goodness. It was honestly, I don't know if we're still recording, but your, um, your questions were amazing. Really? Thank you. I truthfully, I've done so many podcasts and your, your questions were just really different. And so I think you really think through your, um, not that other people don't, but I think you really, you kind of look at it from a different perspective, which is really interesting. So I would highly recommend your podcast. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, we are definitely still recording and I I really appreciate that. And um, so thank you. You can can throw that in there. I will. (laughs) (laughs) Appreciate it. 